Well, I think maybe we'll get started because it seems like the influx of people into the waiting room um, has died down a bit. Um, thank you all for joining us on this Saturday morning or Saturday afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, it's really wonderful to have you all here as part of this final conversation of, believe it or not, our fifth conference. Uh, my name is Nadia Lambeck, um, and on behalf of my co-panel organizers, uh, Don Buckingham, Patricia Galveo Ferreira, um, I just want to welcome you all for this final panel. Um, I think the, the conference itself and this final panel have been focused on thinking about territorial food systems, the ways in which law um, both facilitates um, the kind of food systems we want and also makes those food systems much more challenging. Uh, and it's great to have this final panel to reflect on that. Um, given we're talking about territory and given the importance of recognizing territory, I want to start um, by saying, even though I'm in this virtual room with all of you, I'm also grounded to land um, and to the traditional land of the Wendat the Seneca and the Mississaugas of the Credit River, uh, where I'm an uninvited guest, um, but here to learn with all of you today. So I'm gonna pass it over now to my co-chair, uh, Don, um, and I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Thanks, Don, take it away. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. It uh, shows a, a certain quality of your fortitude to be able to uh, have uh, it be in attendance for our last panel. I do hope that uh, you will be satiated. I feel like I've been uh, feasting all weekend or the last three days, and this uh, might be the final banquet. And so I hope that you uh, will indulge and have lots of questions for our panelists. This is really meant to be a dialogue. And um, like Nadia, um, I also uh, really want to um, uh, talk about the territoriality systems and to start to acknowledge that my home is on located on unceded Algonquin uh, Anishinaabe uh, territory. They are the past and the present and the future guardians of this land and also the customary keepers and defenders of the uh, Ottawa water, River watershed. And you know, we talk a lot about land, but um, when we're talking about food, nothing grows without water and guardians of land and water are important. And so we wanna move forward thinking about this dialogue in its many and multi uh, faceted dimensions. So we, we have a few objectives for this uh, last session. It's a little bit different than the other sessions in that it's going to be a, an interactive dialogue where we give each of the speakers a few minutes at the beginning to kind of tell us a bit about themselves. So there won't be any introductions to the panelists um, because you have their bios on the, uh, on the website. And also uh, really this session is a lot about exploring the very many dimensions of uh, food systems and how they interact with territoriality. And so we want the, the, the um, the panelists to tell us a, a bit about both their professional and personal involvement in food systems. We're very complex beings and we don't just hang our, our, um, our day clothes up in the closet and then come home and not affect, be affected by food systems and territoriality. So uh, what we're going to do is we're going to start with our, our four panelists. We, we have been blessed very much, uh, thankful to these panelists who we think cover uh, very many different dimensions, at least uh, from a professional sense of how they see the food system. And so I'm gonna start with um, uh, two questions for the panelists. And these two questions will give us a bit of an opportunity to see who they are and how they are engaged in the food systems that they uh, belong, uh, find themselves working in. And so I'm gonna give this, this question, this opening question is, in what dimension of the food system do you spend your professional and personal time? So that's an open question to say, what do you do with food? And the second question is, really related to this panel, and that is going to be, when you hear the concept territorial food system, how does that inform your professional or personal understanding of food? So I'm gonna throw that open, and I'm basically going to have an order, it's going to be alpha Roma, uh, uh, alphabetical, and we're gonna go with Lauren, uh, Dawn, 
Peter and Milana, and I'll alphabetical with last name if anyone's curious as to how I rearrange the alphabet. So uh, let's let's start with Lauren. Those two questions: your personal and professional dimension of the food system, and what you think of when you think of territorial food systems. Thanks, Don, for that question. And it's not often when you have the last name of Martin that you end up going first alphabetically, but here we are. Um, so my title is Government and Food Industry Relations Manager, and that is with the Canadian Cattlemen's Association. As background to the association itself, it represents 60,000 producers of beef cattle across Canada. These 60,000 producers are made up of small farmers, big farmers, feedlot operators, and ranchers from coast to coast. And then personally, if I were to run with Don's metaphor of, of the suit, so, so that's, that's my title, that's my suit. But once I take that suit off, I think I, I put on a pair of pants in which I can get dirty in um, because I really, like, I really like knowing everything there is to know about growing food. And then maybe I'd put, it on, put on an apron over top. I like to know what it's like to cook all sorts of different types of food and the different cultures that I can intersect with when I'm cooking different foods. Um, and then maybe I'd even put on a hat because there's, uh, there's an intellectual interest that I have in learning about the food system. And I would say living in Ottawa, which I should have mentioned at the outset as everyone else has an, 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 uh, an important note to always make, is that I am calling from Ottawa, the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin and, and Anishinaabe people. Um, but here in beautiful sunny Ottawa today, I, I get to exist in this microcosm of individuals who are working within the food system at the agricultural level. So um, it's sort of an interesting, honestly, it's an infinitely interesting uh, place to be. Um, there's, it, it's, it's both a practical space of, of how, how different commodities get to, from, the, from the seed to the table. Um, and, uh, and, I, and I can't get enough of it. Um, and I'm so pleased to be here to, to discuss more about, about that perspective and to learn from all of you because, because while I have my perspective, there's always more learning to be done in the food system. And then uh, Don, the second question, which I do believe I'm supposed to answer in succession, um, the question of territoriality in the food system and what do I think of it? So if I had to answer that honestly, the question stretched me. I think uh, for sure, um, and my first reaction was maybe perplexity. Um, so I would say that I don't use the concept of territorial food system terribly often, but if I stretch the definition uh, to fit my day-to-day, -to, -day, to fit my suit um, in the cattle context, I would say that I think about territoriality as the supply chain. So all the way back at the beginning, first is the territory upon which the cow reaches maturity and the underlying co uh, legal context there of property. And then also the somatic context of sustainability and ensure that those, those lands uh, continue for generations of production. And then my thinking for territoriality flows through, follows the cow through the, the food chain. Um, from a farmer's perspective, how does that cow get to market how as a producer am I paid for that work and 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 that product um, how do trade agreements allow me to get products to the end user and uh, because uh, in Canada cattle is uh, about half of cattle produced here is exported and then finally if I thought about territoriality in the cattle context it's this increasing in volume discussion about Beef's quote unquote territory on the plate, uh, beef, beef's plate, place, sorry, on the plate. Um, but in saying all, the, all those things uh, about territory, I must also say that I think the concept makes me a little bit uncomfortable. If I'm coming, if I'm approaching the food system as I am right now from kind of a commodity context, then when I say ter territory, it sort of makes me feel as if I have to put up boundaries. Um, I'm identifying that, okay, well, this is, this is my territory and this is not your territory. I kind of have to distinguish winners and losers. And if there's anything that I really continue to say about the food system, and, and I know we're going to explore it here, is that it's incredibly complex and the siloed thinking, um, which, which 
I know many of us can refer to um, isn't necessarily helping in answering those complex questions. So that's my little diatribe on how I'd answer those first two questions. Thank you, Lauren. That's a great way to kick off. And we really do have a diversity of voices at the table today. And so I'm going to talk, uh, pass the baton over to Dawn. And if you can uh, take us through those two questions as well. Okay, uh, thank you. I just greeted you all in my Shikwatmuk language. I said, hello, everyone. And um, in terms of the dimension that I see the food system in, I guess that depends on um, how, um, yeah, I feel like I, I see the food system through multiple dimensions, um, through a third eye seeing. And I think that as an indigenous, a Shikwatmuk woman, um, and with mixed heritage, um, I have audit Irish and Scottish ancestry as well. Um, I think I was born into that interface between two different dimensions of the food system, but ultimately having grown up as the elder survivor of uh, intergenerational impacts of Indian residential school, I, I can speak to um, my Shikwetmuk and the indigenous food system, the reality that we live in within the ancient um, kind of third eye seeing and ways of knowing about food on a really intimate level and how that, um, the important role that plays in our, you know, asserting our laws, um, our indigenous laws in praxis. Um, and I think that that's really, really significant um, when I was invited to this this discussion, I, I've thought a lot about that. And and um, and I think it's a really critical time right now in terms of um, broadening the uh, transcending a lot of the uh, conflict and contradictions uh, when we think about territoriality and how the colonial system of agricultural uh, policies, planning and governance frameworks have asserted arbitrary political boundaries on um, Indigenous territories. And that is our land, that is our territory, that is our dignity, that is our food sovereignty. And that is really a critical, um, I'm kind of nervous talking about it because it's so important to us. And we're at a critical juncture right now um, where our food systems, our Indigenous food systems, hunting, fishing, uh, farming and gathering corridors are being seriously impacted and communities are in a crisis. Um, so I think in terms of territoriality, the land, territory and dignity um, is about social justice as much as it is about uh, environmental justice and they too cannot be separated. It's about social policy. It's about reconceptualizing frameworks. Um, and transcending beyond that linear kind of siloed, as Lauren um, um, identified, that siloed um, kind of fragmented system of which we're trying to function and shift the narrative beyond a white supremacy kind of narrative of agriculture and um, productionism and resource extraction. Um, these are all very big, serious systemic issues. And I, I just, I just can't, can't uh, talk about this without um, just laying it all out there. So um, I, was there another question? That so Dawn, do you make a distinction between your professional orientation and your personal orientation to food? Oh, okay, yes, thank you. Um, well, as I mentioned, um, growing up in the genocidal um, kind of reality of Indian residential school and the impact that that's had on my family, myself, um, and my community who are very much struggling right now um, in multiple overlapping crises. Um, I come to this as part of my personal healing journey. It's the only way I can actually hold myself in this work um, and be, um, you know, and not fall into kind of a lot of the, the poor mental health um, and the lifestyle I came out of that many of our Indigenous peoples are suffering with in some of the most food insecure neighborhoods in terms of poverty and drug addiction and um, 
poor mental health and all the social determinants of health that we hear about in the news and the huge disparity and gaps that we experience there. Um, that is where I come from personally, because I come from that reality. I've lived it, I'm overcoming it, and I'm using food sovereignty as a framework for doing that and for remembering the ancestral, the third eye seeing the really deep ways of knowing that most oldest living memory of what it means to live on this land and territory with dignity is what I've been appreciating inquiring into through this work. And it's a really important part of, you know, even my heart when I talk about it, I feel, I feel a little heavy, you know, but I'm, we're building resistance or we're, we're building um, resilience in that with the huge networks that are coming together to to support that some of whom I see are on the panel and in the audience today and I thank you Malena and Kathleen Gibson and and um, I saw Daniel Mendoza and we have some amazing networks and I I know I think I recognize a few names here but um, yeah that's really thank yes thank you Thank you, Don. I, I, again, just a completely, you know, a different lens that we're we're putting out so that we can see just the complexity of the food system. I'm going to turn it over to Peter now, and I suspect we'll have a third lens. So, Peter, uh, professional and personal uh, food and food systems, and what what about the concept of territorial uh, territorial food systems? I'm a uh, professor of public policy at, at the Johnson Shriama Graduate School of Public Policy in Saskatoon. Uh, we have campuses on both the Regina and Saskatoon campuses, and we, uh, which means that we're we're uh, in the territory in the uh, area of uh, of Treaties Four, Six, and the uh, traditional homeland of the Métis. Um, in some ways, I'm a bit anomalous. I'm I'm interested in innovation and technological change in the agri-food space. And my focus is particularly on how that influences and, and contributes to global food security. Um, I'm, I'm a, bit of, a bit of an unusual fit. I'm not, I'm three generations, two or three generations from the farm, although I can trace back most of my family at some point were farmers. Uh, but agriculture is a place that draws people who are interested in how technological change occurs. And then I got more immersed, partly because it's a transparent system. It's, it's, it's everywhere in the world. It's still the large, single largest industry in the world, including in Canada and in, in my province. And it's, it's, it's undergone a whole series of transformations that tell us a lot about how we make choices, both at the individual level and at the industrial level and the societal level. Uh, so to go to your question of sort of how do I frame this territorially, uh, there's, there's a tendency because of the way we've structured agriculture, it's it's nationally governed, governed, and in Canada, it's a federal-provincial joint uh, constitutional uh, priority. Uh, and and farmers, in and of themselves, have organized themselves territorially to market and to supply products and to produce uh, new technologies for their their uh, their enterprises. But uh, that's just the tip of the iceberg, because the the reality is that as you move away from the farmstead, territory expands massively. As you move upstream to how we're producing new technologies and new uh, new opportunities in the farming space. A lot of that is coming from national and global systems that are are disconnected from the farmstead itself. I mean, Saskatchewan is a a, a major farm research center, but it but we're inter globally connected for virtually everything we do. Uh, so there's a there's a global republic of science that that creates the the, the information we use to drive the particularly the biosciences, but but both, but also mechanization and the the soil uh, plant uh, water interface that 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 fundamentally drives the productivity of of our plants and our soils. So there's a there's a global system that's that's fairly open and transparent, but it it goes through in a, a, a very large research space about forty billion dollars of of U.S. dollars of research annually. Uh, a lot of it's public in national and international research centers and big universities, but a lot of it's uh, in the private sector. About a quarter of it's in, in large and small companies around the world that bring the seeds and the technologies to farmers. And then at the other end of the supply chain, we sell to the world. We don't eat much of what we produce in Western Canada. We have about 80% of the farmland, about half the farmers, 
And uh, pretty much everything we produce, we sell to the world. We sell to over 100 countries. And uh, I think 90 to 95% of the volumes are, are exported beyond Canada and most of them beyond North America. So that makes us a bit of an unusual place. And virtually, I think the last estimate I've seen is somewhere between 75 and 80% of the, the processed foodstuffs that you'll buy in the grocery store will have something that came from a Western Canadian farm. It, it might be an ingredient, it might be a, a, a larger portion, but, but we're, we're everywhere. So consumers and, and world market trade systems and all of those are interconnected to what we can do on our farmsteads and what, what technologies can we, we can draw from the world system adapt to our needs and, and then uh, uh, use to, to secure and improve our global food security. So that's, that's sort of my take. I, beyond being an, a person who eats and a person who, who has this, this, this uh, history in the family, uh, this is more of an intellectual and policy exercise. I've done it both in governments and in industry and now in, uh, in the, uh, the uh, uh, university setting. Thanks, Peter. That is, a, a, again, a vastly different perspective than um, we've seen with our other two presenters or panelists and uh, undeniably uh, part of the complexity. Um, so I think we're going to go now to Milana and Milana is going to give us yet again a fourth perspective, which takes us, I'm guessing, into some of the urban uh, landscape. Yeah, thanks, Don, and uh, thanks to the organizers for having me. Um, so um, in terms of how I identify or see myself, I think I would most often uh, call myself a food policy or food justice advocate. Um, and I am humbly um, living on the uh, traditional territories of the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. Um, and the lands that I am lucky enough to work on are governed by uh, Treaty 13 uh, with the Mississaugas of the Credit as well as the Williams uh, Treaties. So um, that is kind of the space where I do a lot of my work, often referred to as Toronto. But uh, I also am kind of lucky enough to, to do a lot of work that also kind of connects a across uh, a variety of different lands and territories um, across kind of what we call Canada, uh, as well as increasingly the international sphere. And I think it's uh, perhaps in contrast to some of my panelists and maybe similarly to others, I think I see my role um, and my work as constantly evolving and changing. And so I actually don't really see uh, my, you know, quote unquote suit or job as distinct from who I am in my everyday. I actually think I see this work as a circle and as I move through different spheres of the complexity in this work, um, I broaden my own knowledge and understanding of contradictions, of challenges, uh, of gaps and of opportunities to, to repair and, and rethink how I do this work and how I show up in those spaces. And I think um, I've been lucky enough to only engage in work that I, I feel connected to. So I'll, I'll share a little bit about what some of that looks like, but uh, recognizing that as that shifts and is iterative, um, I, I wear many hats and, and hold many roles. So um, some of the work that I think uh, most deeply connects me to this idea of territoriality um, is, is some work I'm doing as a, as a staff person at the City of Toronto. So, um, and maybe another thing I should say is that uh, I won't speak as much to titles because for me, a lot of the work is the doing. Um, I think that we hold titles and oftentimes I'm, sh I'm shifting and wearing many hats in these different roles that I play. So uh, maybe I'll speak in terms of networks and connections because I think that that's actually what I hope to talk about more is where I see the opportunity as well as the challenge in this concept of territoriality and linkages. Um, so I, I do policy work at the city of Toronto uh, in the Confronting Anti-Black Racism Unit, which I think uh, is a really important space to come into um, because it really does think about these broader structural systems uh, that often, you know, are, I think are increasingly coming to the conversation of how we think about food systems and, and territories and space, but for many, many years have been kind of um, absent in our conversations around how we address equity. And so in doing that work, I'm uh, leading the development of a community led and municipally supported black food sovereignty plan. And that's really looking to address the disproportionate rates of food insecurity uh, among black Torontonians um, and really think about what are the terms and principles on which the local food system needs to be governed by to ensure that there's self-determination 
for, um, for Black communities in the city uh, that really considers uh, the impacts of the legacies of uh, white supremacy and colonialism, of economic exclusion, and also of kind of the trauma and weaponization around food and access to land that really um, has led to inequities, not only for Black communities, but for many of the racialized and particularly Indigenous communities uh, living uh, in urban spaces. Um, I've also more recently been doing a lot of work um, uh, as a kind of a delegate with the United Nations in relation to the 53rd and 54th Commission on Population and Development, which has uh, really been thinking about uh, nutrition and food security. And I think this work has called me um, and I felt very connected to it in relation to thinking about how, you know, recognizing what I what I think I heard Don mention about this idea that a lot of the, the boundaries, uh, you know, whether that be of, of nation states, uh, of provinces, these are arbitrary and our connections as humans, as people, and our connections to land and to other communities is is not subject to those to those uh, boundaries. And how can we start to think about our, our, our food systems and our territories as being connected beyond that and really reflect on those linkages. And so I think in that context, thinking about things like the right to food and around uh, governance models to support um, those different systems to be more interlinked and connected and sustainable. Um, I also am a member of the Canadian Food Policy Advisory Council, which is working to uh, really support the, the federal government's approaches to uh, implementation of Canada's food policy. And I think in that context, I have been a huge advocate around uh, the importance of community driven and local governance systems and have always really believed that um, municipalities and and local communities have the best uh understanding and 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 um expertise around what um what they need but also relationships with land to be able to respond to that most effectively and intuitively i would say and so with that regard really thinking about how that relates to a, a federal policy structure which is quite far removed from the very local context and last but not least um, I'm very privileged to work uh, with quite a diverse uh, group of folks as part of an alliance uh, called Food Secure Canada, which uh, works uh, with diverse food system actors uh, moving toward uh, kind of a vision of a more just, um, equitable and sustainable food system. And I think uh, one that once again really thinks about this idea of what does a more democratic um, community led food system look like that not only thinks about governance, but also thinks about uh, the responsibility uh, and knowledge of those communities to, to um, support better uh, and work toward repair of environmental and social relationships. Um, so those are kind of the spheres in which I'm entering into this work. Um, in addition to many other kind of roles and spaces I've been able to navigate and move in. But I think coming to this question around um, you know, this idea of territoriality um, and territory and how that relates to the work that I do in my everyday. And the first thing that actually came to mind was when I was doing my master's research, um, where I was uh, so, so lucky to have the experience to actually uh, learn from um, Afro-Ecuadorian peoples who uh, were marooned in Ecuador and had been living uh, in their, what they consider to be their traditional territories for more than 400 years, long before Ecuador was a nation state, um, and had a unique uh, intermixing with other indigenous peoples there uh, to govern that land and have successfully been one of the few if only um, Afro-descended populations in Latin America to actually be granted land rights on the base of culture. And for them, this, this isn't adequate enough, and I'll hopefully speak more about this, but this idea of territorialidad is really fundamental to their understanding of self, of, of their histories, of their ancestors, and of their role and responsibility and connection as stewards of land. And I think that uh, that really helped me re-understand the significance of a place-based approach, not only to food systems, but also to, to rights, to, to territory rights and to land rights and, and different frames around that. And I think that, that that thinking and that conception has been so foundational to how I've approached my, my more recent work here uh, in, in Toronto and, and in Canada more generally. And I think 
what it has allowed me to see is the deep kind of complexity and contradictions and diversity within the context of, of um, food systems, food ecosystems, and really in a context like Toronto, where there's so many diverse populations living within one, one, one of many different systems, I think it really shifts us from thinking about or, or kind of opens the door, I should say, to think about how these things coexist and different frames uh, to approach an idea of, of territory. And so, you know, in the context of working at a city, I think, you know, terms like territorial food systems uh, is often kind of intermingled with terms like rural or urban linkages or city region food systems. Um, and I think that uh, the opportunity there is that or, or, or I guess really what I would say, not even the opportunity, but the, the issue that is kind of comes up with that is that we often think of this term being linked to rural context. And I think uh, the rights of rural communities tend to be omitted in that conversation. So there's this dichotomy of this rural over here and urban over here. And I think it reinforces an inequitable development model, which, which puts industrial and urban growth pressure on rural areas and on small scale producers to feed an urban population. And so more recently doing some research um, as an Action Canada fellow looking at um, some of the challenges that diverse, so indigenous, black, immigrant, uh, women, youth have in, in, in connecting with, with land and, and entering into land work, farm agroecology work. Um, I think we see how this is, how this kind of comes up and is reinforced. And I think for me, coming back to to how this this fits into our work i think there's an opportunity to really um consider how rethinking our approach to food systems and thinking about uh this this scope of territoriality of being about the linkages not about the rural and the urban but the actual link between them is kind of a bit of a missing piece and that the scope of you know, what this urban and what this rule is needs to be expanded to think about how do we cultivate the relationship between these two things? What are the, the contradictions and the tensions and the opportunities to have them be in a more symbiotic system? And how can that new knowledge of an approach actually better inform um, our, our, our more sustainable, more equitable, and more interlinked food systems? Thank you, Milana. That's a great, great segue into our next round of questions. But before I turn it over to my co-moderator, Nadia, I just want to thank the, the panelists so far for giving us such a, a crisp picture of the different places where you, you, might have, you might see where the food system is going and where, the, where you find yourself situated. It's like opening a box and seeing um, a, a number of things that don't necessarily look like they're related to each other and knowing they all fit together somehow. And that's what we've got to start to uh, discuss now. But uh, if you have a member of, of, of the audience, if you have a question, now is the time to start uh, typing those questions down and putting in them into the, the chat function so that we uh, are able to curate those questions and feed them into this panel so that they can be uh, challenged or we can be challenged by them from your questions. So now without any further ado, I'm gonna pass it back to Nadia and Nadia is going to dialogue with our panelists uh, with the second round of questions, Nadia. Thanks Don and thanks especially to the panelists. Um, I just, I feel like you've blown open the idea of territorial for us in so many interesting ways beyond kind of place and space into future and, and past generations, uh, into beings beyond humans, into thinking across borders and challenging the existence of borders, um, into thinking about territory and rights. So um, this is just really great. Um, and I think you'll probably blow open our next question too, which is totally fine. Um, so, and, and, and what we'd like actually. So our next set of questions, and we'll just pass kind of quickly to each of you and then open it up into a conversation. Um, but I'd love to know in each of your distinctive fields, um, what challenges and opportunities do you think exist today for territorial food systems? And maybe just to build on that, is it even helpful to think in terms of territory uh, when we think about the kind of um, challenges and opportunities going forward to 
uh, transform, um, as our keynote speaker on Thursday said, to restore um, our food systems, uh, to make them places that um, are more equitable, more just, um, uh, better serving the needs of people and beings and the environment. So um, I think I'll reverse the order um, and I'll start Don uh, with you if you'd like. Okay, thank you. Um, so the challenges um, that come up in my mind, first of all, are, um, I guess the, the I guess. entire, oh, sorry. Was that? Um, John Buckingham, can you mute yourself? I think that's what that is. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So the challenges I'm going to um, do as I usually do and uh, start at the kind of um, most broadest thinking and kind of try and narrow that down a little bit um, to thinking about uh, opportunities and the different ways that um, the uh, agricultural uh, global agri-food system kind of framework um, interfaces with indigenous food systems um, in both um, contentious ways and some in complementary ways. Um, uh, so the challenges, I think the points of the main points of contention on a really high level is that the um, the global agri-food system, the, the, the narrative of agriculture in general um, that was in, in so-called BC was introduced in just in the late 1880s. It's a relative kind of baby compared to indigenous food systems on which, you know, have been unseated and unsurrendered um, for the most part. Well, for I would say for all parts, even where trade treaties have been neg negotiated, those should not be interpreted as a surrendering or um, of the land. Um, indigenous people still persist in our hunting, our fishing, and our gathering strategies at a really uh, a really broad um, scale and a in a very holistic health narrative. Um, that cannot be reconciled in the same framework that was designed to dispossess us in agricultural land and water uh, rights strategies that were imposed at the time when agriculture was first being developed here in BC on par with British morality and a cultural hierarchy that saw agrarians as superior to hunters and gatherers. Um, yet we persist into the 21st century in what was, you know, a very wealthy and abundant economy um, in Salish territory alone, which is the territory, the language group that I belong to. Um, it spans from the Rocky Mountains to Vancouver Island, and it's, um, it's one of the uh, largest known peacefully governed cooperative political units. And it, it was huge and it was very abundant and very sustainable and it's ancient and it's still alive. And so when I think of the challenges, um, I, you know, in thinking about truth and reconciliation and justice, the Honorable Justice Marie uh, uh, Sinclair, um, when he released the, the report for the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, he also said that we cannot reconcile within the same um, frameworks for colonial policy planning and governance that were designed to dispossess us. Um, agriculture was where they first started grabbing the land and the system still very much favors um, the top 1% who control, basically it's not de a democratic system, it's a technocracy and it's feudalist. And I think this is, these are huge. These are the biggest systemic challenges of humanity. Um, we've seen on the geological timeline of humanity how um, the health and integrity of both humans and the ecosystems have declined and how that correlates with the introduction of agriculture 10 to 12,000 years ago. Um, so I think we need to shift the narrative. I think there's a huge potential with Indigenous um, um, title and rights um, that are being asserted at a very um, powerful rate right now. And we see the way that indigenous peoples are mobilizing um, 
you know, we have our Thailand rights entrenched in the Canadian Constitution, Section 35.1. Um, we have rights that don't require that we even prove our title. And I think that's what Indigenous food sovereignty provides is a powerful framework for inserting Indigenous law in praxis. It's through, you know, the, the uh, hunting and fishing and gathering and farming that we actually enhance the biodiversity. And we are in a, a crisis right now, not just a global food insecurity crisis. We are in a crisis of ecosystems collapse. We're in a climate crisis. We're in a public health crisis that is all very much interconnected and very much a part of the, the erosion of the complex system of indigenous biodiversity and cultural heritage. I think if we cannot reconcile with indigenous, with um, indigenous peoples in a deeper, more meaningful way by reconceptualizing frameworks for policy, food systems policy, uh, planning and governance, uh, then I fear that we, you know, I think that is a key opportunity. I think there's a lot of willingness right now. There are huge networks mobilizing. It's actually really exciting to be a part of it. And um, it's hard to keep up with, but we need governments to fund that adequately. We need, you know, the, the corporations, the, the reason why I say technocracy, because the food system is controlled through technology now, that's not democracy, that's governments favoring the top 1% in their ability to consolidate huge tracts of land water and infrastructure, while Indigenous peoples and Black and people of colour are among the most vulnerable and still don't even have clean drinking water, let alone functioning irrigation systems. Um, there's many irrigation systems around the province that are in disrepair. There's a lot of trauma associated with Indigenous peoples being involved in agriculture because it's not our narrative, it's not our seasonal cycle. Um, you know, we hunt and we fish, we go on a different seasonal cycle um, than agriculture. Um, but there's some, you know, there's some opportunity to kind of look at how that cross fertilizes and how Indigenous peoples could meaningfully participate in agribusiness, which agriculture is a very heavily subsidized venture and challenging for anybody, unless you're a technology a part of the technocracy, um, but even more so for Indigenous peoples who not only have trauma associated with the, the white supremacist narrative underlying it, but also are not able to function in a capital intense, a capitalist system that was really not designed to favor us. So I know that's a lot of challenges, but I think there's a lot of opportunity to decolonize food systems and transition out of a, a production oriented, like a linear mathematical formula to feed a global food system to a more kind of full cost accounting system of a small scale farmers for food sovereignty and to a more regenerative life giving holistic health narrative. I think productionism was a narrative that was instituted in the industrial revolution. It's reached the limits of its growth very clearly with ecosystems collapse. Um, and I think that it's a beautiful opportunity for humanity to, ex to express the human condition and experience it in a different way. I think there's a lot of work to do to make that happen, but I'm, I'm seeing there's a lot of willingness. And I think as Indigenous peoples assert their land claims more and more, I think we're going to see a lot more land come under um, the, the governance of Indigenous nations, there's 98 nations across Canada and 11 major Aboriginal lang group, language groups. I think if we could think of territorial food systems as being defined by the language groups, as they are ultimately defined by the land and the watershed and the various ecoregions, I think if you put that on a map and overlay the boundaries of ecoregions, you'd see they're the same boundaries as Indigenous language groups and Indigenous territories. I think that's a, there's a lot of huge potential in that. And I think, um, yeah, I'm excited of how organized a lot of the nations are, are around that and the potential to influence. Um, 
We do a lot of facilitating of decolonizing food systems. We've developed a framework um, that helps to give structure and uh, cultural safety to create ethical spaces of engagement on how that can happen and how to generate the research and reconceptualize frameworks and be in those that discourse together. Um, I think there's a lot there's a lot of opportunities for the court system um, of which some of the indigenous nations are under duress choosing to um, to to work in to assert our title and rights. Um, there's um, opportunities to develop um, not just environmental assessment frameworks that can assess more adequately the health and social and cultural risks of different kinds of activities that are happening on our indigenous land and food systems, um, both from agri industrial agriculture, large scale industrial agriculture, but also from resource extraction um, and to really show what a different kind of a way of assessing in a way that transcends beyond the balance of convenience that are often used in courts to make decisions around resource projects that are under that are contentious and in the courts. Um, and I think that there's, you know, the balance of convenience is really about an ethical kind of values based conversation on who gets who's being more convenience inconvenienced. And for indigenous peoples, um, there is no framework to assess that it's, I mean, there's the archeological overview assessment, there is provincial and federal environmental assessments, but they need to be broadened in scope and scale in terms of health, holistic health and um, well-being of indigenous peoples. And I think by doing that, there's opportunity to increase the health and well-being of all people, um, of all of humanity. I think until we start to see it as our realities being inter, um, interconnected, um, I think that's the opportunity, and that's a beautiful, a beautiful thing to do to to look at healing some of the harms of the past, and that not only live within the memories of our bodies and our ancestors, but in the land itself and what we're seeing happen on the land. So, so I'll leave it at that and thank you for, for, for the opportunity. Thank you, Don. I love this idea that it's a beautiful opportunity, but that it requires a lot of work um, to rethink and to really learn from voices that we've systematically silenced, I think, in the past. So thank you for that. Um, Peter, do you want to jump in next? Uh, and then and then maybe after Peter, I'm going to call on Milana. So get ready, Milana. Sure. And, and I think what this conversation is, is presenting is that there are a whole range of, of both physical territories and territories of the mind. And, and what we need probably is, is a greater diversity and resilience within and between those spaces. The space I work in is, is, the, is the part that that Don says may be part of the problem, but it's also part of, of the solution that, that has taken us to where we are today. Um, you know, so, so territory can be a, a threat and an opportunity at the same time. As an opportunity, virtually everything that, that we have created as human beings is because people coexist. We breathe the same air, we, we, we spark on each other, we, have, we, we do things that are, are different. And by doing, them, by doing things that are different, we advance our capacity and the quality of our lives. It doesn't matter whether we're talking about indigenous communities in Mexico, campesinos doing farm, you know, farm uh, uh, land races, or whether we're talking about the the science, industrial, producer-led research teams that that occupy our labs in Saskatoon. They're they're groups of people who are motivated by trying to improve their lot in some way, shape, or form. In my case, I'm I'm interested in the the, the industrial space, and and it's been quite productive in many ways. I mean, it, it's not industry in the sense that it's a multinational company. These are large family-owned enterprises that, that are anchoring to the land. Uh, some of them may use corporate structures, but they're still husbands, wives, sons, uncles, aunts that are, are the primary owners of the land and the, the, the decision makers. I mean, the, the, the reality is that for the global food security, maybe not local, 
but for global, we do need international trade. We need, do need uh, uh, some surplus producers of, of product so that those areas that are, are unable to sustain and produce enough to, to generate uh, livelihood can have enough food to survive. And, and you know, we've gone from 85% of the world being food insecure 100 years ago, and you know, only one in, in uh, seven people having enough to really live and, and, uh, and survive. That's about 200 million people that were, were in good shape. Now we have 90% uh, of the people who are, are not insecure on a normal year. This year may be a little bit different, but most years. So we 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 moved a long way, and in the in that period, we've gone from less than two billion people to almost eight billion people. So we've we've done a lot for humanity. The question is, how do we we advance and refine and improve? And and clearly, territory is a big part of of adapting these things to the environmental conditions, the social conditions, the economic conditions, and the local aspirations of communities. And so there's a there's a creative tension here, I suspect, and that's that's the governance question, you know that that's the ultimate territory. Uh, individuals can can do what they choose, be they individuals or individual firms, but we're all governed by somebody. We live somewhere. There's nobody who's outside the 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 boundaries of of the laws and the the regulations and the policies and the the nation states we've created. Uh, sometimes we get adjudicated and managed by international rules. Sometimes by national rules sometimes by local rules, sometimes by informal rules, traditional norms and, and practices. Each of those are powerful motivators and they either guide efforts or they, they control. And so there's, you know, as lawyers, I, I encourage you to think holistically about the challenges here because there's a, there's a range of things that the law provides the architecture to and there's a range of things that, that, that the law does not speak to without those other governing systems, the, the, what I call the Republic of Science, you would have more uh, bigger challenges of managing the ownership and control and management of research space, for example. So there's a, there's a mix of, you know, this, this gets to the complexity of your question that, 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 you know, partly what you want to accomplish will determine what you're able to do. And, you know, our motivations are, are not all the same. You know, that, that's part of the reality. Some people are just in this game because they're curious. A lot of the scientists I know, they have no no skin in the game beyond they just want to try something cool and see if it works. Some people are in it for profit, and that's not just multinational companies. It's farmers want to make a profit too. Uh, some of them, some people are in it for lifestyle. That's a legitimate purpose for for how we use our lands. Some people are in there because there's a strong cultural historical connection between the land and their aspirations and their goals. Some people are are in are interested in the environmental footprint. And ultimately though, our food system is about producing nutrition. And so we don't wanna lose that in the, 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 the opening up of the conversation in the, the governing system to these other motives and, and purposes for our food system. So it's, it's a mix. I think there's a, there's a high degree of complexity. I think all of the aspirations can be managed within the governing systems, but it's not either or, it's finding space for both because we need a mix of these 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 uh, roles for the, mar the the food system, or we will be less than we are. We'll either be hungry, or we'll be culturally or, or historically uh, uh, disconnected from from our uh, our views and our, our preferences. So, let me leave that as an opening gambit. Thanks, Peter. I think you've done a good job of reminding us that in all parts of the food system, there are actually people. So if we speak about these complex things like science or trade, or as Priscilla put in the, in the chat, neoliberalism, there are also people enacting those um, in all places and people eating and, and, and people in all aspects. Okay, I, I told you you were next, Milana, and it's your turn. Okay, thanks, Nadia. Um, yeah, I think it's interesting because, you know, something, and in fact, actually, I think Dawn is someone who often reminds me of this, and I'm very grateful for this reminder is, yes, there are people, but there's also the environment. The environment is a living, breathing thing, our waters, um, you know, animals, uh, trees, the air. So I think it's like coming back to this question around uh, the real opportunity of this idea of, of you know, true cost accounting and more ethical practices. And I think the real opportunity that Peter suggested is that 
um, as lawyers, hopefully many of you listening, have a real opportunity to lay the foundation for some of that thinking and really be that foundational backbone to drive some of these, uh, you know, the on the ground, what I often like to call warriors who, who are doing this, this real work every day on the land. And that in some cases might be, you know, farmers in other cases that is indigenous peoples, um, you know, land stewards and, and guardians. And I think that there has to be room to consider the variety of challenges uh, and you know, proposals that each of these groups are putting forward to have that more holistic view, of course, of people, but still of the environment. So uh, maybe what I'll say is I'll, I'll come back to like, you know, maybe starting from this bigger sphere of conversations I've been having that relate to some of these things and then maybe more specific thinking yeah, from a municipal perspective. So one of the things that I think in like recent conversations around, uh, you know, challenges in the food system uh, as they relate to, you know, things like the right to food uh, and kind of human rights more broadly, what we're seeing in conversations of uh, is that we're really seeing that human rights have been dropped largely from policy documents and discussions. And member states and UN institutions and, and Canada have really reinforced weaker and weaker language and commitments um, that increasingly push responsibility onto the corporate sector via language that uses like inclusion and access and empowerment and social responsibility in lieu of, of actual rights. And so whether we think of these as the key rights uh, of Indigenous peoples, whether we think about this as the key rights for our governments to actually play a role in ensuring that there are the minimal conditions. So that's not saying that the government should, uh, you know, control the systems, but it is a responsibility to create the basic foundation to allow people to have access, especially recognizing um, that there's, there's, there's clear power relations in all of this, and the government has a key role to be uh, a regulator in, in a way to, to ensure that there is greater equity and empowerment for a variety of those voices, particularly the ones we heard are, are, that are most disenfranchised in the current system. And so I think, you know, when we look at like SDGs having weak human rights commitments, it, it's very clear that if we're really trying to move forward with this vision um, it, of, of a more sustainable, equitable, just food system, it cannot happen without respecting, protecting and fulfilling human rights, uh, you know, without with, you know, a full system that allows civil society, indigenous peoples, people of color, black communities to really be, uh, particularly indigenous peoples, uh, co-leads uh, in, this, in this conversation and have a seat at that broader decision-making table. Um, and, you know, I think that when thinking about uh, the importance of, of rights in this conversation, I come back to kind of what I had raised earlier in my discussion around this example of, of Afro-Ecuadorians and being uh, provided land rights on the basis of culture and not on the basis of, of uh, their, their rights to that land as being, you know, uh, historic peoples there ancestrally connected to that, to that uh, place. And I think the opportunity that a territory uh, kind of argument brings to this. And I, I think that we can also look at that here in the sense that in their instance, um, they were not able to realize their full rights when we, they saw the increasing impacts of um, exploitation of resources and increasing economic exclusion pushed many of those community members into urban areas further removed from their cultural um, you know, histories and traditions and it in fran disenfranchised them to access those rights. And so as we saw a smaller and smaller group of that population uh, being connected to those histories and traditions and that culture, they were, which was as a result of those broader external forces we've heard many of us speaking about, we, we saw that they no longer were entitled to those rights. And I think we can see a similar thing happening in Canada, of course, when we think about Indigenous peoples uh, and urban Indigenous peoples uh, being disenfranchised of many of the rights that they still have as a result of, of where they're living and uh, maybe being less connected to their culture and traditions that have been actively erased. So thinking about, um, how some of these learnings can better uh, better inform, you know, how we approach our uh, food systems, I think is key. I, I also have an opportunity to think about, uh, you know, a recent research I was doing was looking at some of those particular barriers for um, diverse groups as they relate to getting into agriculture. And as we heard Don say, like many Indigenous peoples don't necessarily connect with the term agriculture in that 
that uh, more normative way, but I think the fastest growing group of people who are moving into um, an agricultural space across a, a variety of kind of uh, approaches, whether that be agroecology or traditional systems or, or more normative approaches to farming are Indigenous peoples. They are the fastest growing population of farmers. And when we look at our legislative uh, systems, particularly around the Indian Act, that completely disenfranchises their, it disenfranchises disenfranchises them of, of being able to actually be able to benefit from those rights they have to to their land, whether that be a reserve land. And so we're seeing how our current system isn't even serving uh, people who have been in many ways have uh, inherent rights to to be able to uh, benefit and work closely and reconnect to their relationships with land. And so there has to be um, kind of a, a shift in that regard. And I think uh, a territory uh, kind of lens and frame to those systems is, is really helpful to start to unpack that and have us reimagine uh, th those systems. I think that also there's an opportunity to, to think about, uh, you know, the fact that many urban centered processes that engage with space, land, ecosystems, resilience, they've conceptualized and elevated urban development and urbanization without meaningful kind of consideration of, of the impacts in rural areas insofar as they accommodate urban priorities. And I think when we look at how COVID-19 has really shown uh, how disconnected our systems were, how uh, many rural communities were increasingly hit, but not so much in the conversation because of the lack of density of population and political, um, you know, uh, I guess being visible in the political sphere to be able to advocate for, for needs in those areas, we start to really see how the impacts and the implications of this inequitable development. And small scale food producers um, really do produce the majority of the world's food. And so when we're thinking about strategies to discuss the role of inclusion of rural communities uh, and rural uh, areas in the, in the visions of what future development or, or, or repair looks like, we have to ensure that their voices are heard. And so I think that really thinking about a lot of the, the things that we've heard from social movements and civil society uh, is really starting to shift from more rural context into thinking about what does urban food sovereignty and the right to food look like? And food and nutrition at the level of cities and regions and um, you know, territories. And I think you know, as, as we heard, there is a real role or local public policy as being really central to this. So bringing in ideas around uh, the roles of public procurement, access to domestic markets, and, and less focus on externally exporting things, um, access to natural resources uh, and, and, and ecosystems, uh, prioritizing things like agroecology, securing land tenure, um, and the preservation of agricultural land, social protection and assistance, um, and really management uh, and empowering the folks who are already managing those, those, common, um, those common land systems, I think are key. And we're starting to see that this false dichotomy that uh, between rural being agriculture over here and food security being urban over here is starting to dissipate. And you know, one initiative that I might speak to in terms of an opportunity is the uh, Milan Urban Food Policy Pact. So this is something that was launched in uh, 2015. It is a mayor-led initiative and it really seeks to think about stronger governance frameworks for local food systems. Um, it represents a process that really affirms the role and responsibilities of local governments uh, to work with uh, communities and local citizens to protect and fulfill not only human rights, but also kind of city region food systems uh, and really is underscored by a participatory kind of decision making that is directly with civil society, small scale producers, indigenous peoples, uh, and really upholds a governance model that is framed around social and economic equity, uh, sustainable diets, uh, nutrition and food production. And so I think this is one example of, of an opportunity to start to think about territorial or city region food systems that is helpful. I also think beyond that, uh, I know one of the, the opening speakers, Terry Lynn, and you raised this, Nadia, spoke about this idea of um, let's not focus so much about transforming our food systems, but about repairing them. And I think something that uh, quite a few, almost a year ago now that Don said to me that has been really foundational in my own thinking is like, we cannot 
repair environmental relationships until we repair social relationships. And I think that this notion of territory is far more complex and gives us room to think about that. And it really does underscore a broader opportunity to think about things like reparations and reparative economies, uh, to bring in conversations around ethical approaches and governance, which is something Food Secure Canada has been thinking a lot about. What does an ethical uh, governance structure look like and how can we think about not one governance but a series of circles that are interlocking that are interdependent and that are really thinking about um, how one system and one decision is actually impacting the other and we can think about that from a municipal to a federal level we can think about that across different populations uh, and different stakeholders, there's really a, lo a lot of room to open up the spheres of governance. We can think about that in animals and landscapes. So I think there's a lot of room to turn to uh, Indigenous ways of knowing to help us reframe our approaches to a lot of these governance systems. Um, and one thing that I would highlight as a challenge, though, and, and that I see in my own work is really, you know, when we have municipalities or governments uh, wading into spaces around conversations of uh, reshaping things with the lens of sovereignty as, as a key principle around this. There's also a worry of the co-optation of what those terms truly mean. And so in really being key that governments and, and uh, different bodies cannot, um, cannot lead, cannot own sovereignty, but that they can create the conditions to ensure that a community-led approach uh, has room to grow and inform a government supported approach. So use those levers that are in place to ensure that communities continue to lead that. And I think that's been a key principle, of course, challenge that uh, we're working through in, in the work at the city of Toronto to ensure how do we have community at, at the fore here while uh, also ensuring that there's an external account process in which government needs to be accountable to and we'll continue to push uh, these two forces moving forward. So that would be uh, some of the, uh, thoughts around challenges and also opportunities in relation to this, this uh, idea. Thanks so much, Milana. Your comments made me think uh, one of the things I've been following the last few weeks is the negotiation of an instrument internationally about agroecology and Canada at every chance that it has, has undercut the use of human rights in that document, um, has agreed with other states uh, to get rid of true cost accounting as a way of addressing um, food systems and has really undercut participation rights throughout. So I think um, we really need to think about how our own government enacts many of the things that you're talking about domestically, but also internationally. So thank you. Um, Lauren, it's up, it's up to you now. All right. Um, and as the, the individual who gets to be the person who responds uh, to this question last, I find myself reflecting on a lot of the aspects that, that the panelists mentioned. So the question is, is whether or not territoriality, like what challenges and opportunities exist for territorial food systems? And then also, is it helpful to think in terms of territory? And at the outset, I reflect that Milana's comments, you spoke about territoriality very eloquently. Um, and But I can't nevertheless, like, so I can see it and I can understand it from your perspective, but I can't nevertheless resonate from it very well. From my perspective, um, again, I would go back to my opening comments about how when I think about territoriality, I think about that immediately kind of creating these boundaries. And when you create boundaries, then you create silos, which which I find are absolutely everywhere in the food system. And I think all of us here talked about some of them. Um, and if if there was like a personal bent to absolutely everything that I, that I like to do in the food system, it's breaking down those barriers. Um, so, so in response to that very specific question, is it important to think or is it is it good to think about this in terms of territoriality? I would say no. Um, but nevertheless, I could use my own language to talk about the opportunities and challenges that do exist. And so I was writing notes because I liked all of this so much, but um, opportunities and challenges. I, I prefer to think about the, the kind of what the territory, like instead of a territoriality aspect of the food system, I like to think about it as a food system, a really interwoven food system 
which if I used a market-based term has inefficiencies which need to be addressed. And if I used a social-based term, I would say it has inequalities that really need to be addressed. And some of those inequalities, like, it, like we all touched on them, but communicating about complex subjects, um, how our food is grown to consumers, that's a complex subject that I have to have to navigate in my work. But then what else we've heard here is the colonial agrarian narrative versus indigenous perspectives and rights and how to reconcile those two. And then something else that I do see in my work quite a bit is this rural urban divide, particularly as I am an individual who communicates with the government. Um, the two kind of dichotomies that continue to separate even in our kind of political sphere is I think becoming increasingly problematic for the food system, at least in Canada. Um, I can't speak globally. And then a couple of other aspects that Peter mentioned about like trade, innovation and science, communicating complex subjects like science um, and, and what brand of science uh, you, you want to use. Um, because science is, is no longer black and white. And then, and then the other thing, the opportunity and the challenge that exists with all of this is that I find there are very little or very few platforms um, to discuss these complex subjects across a range of stakeholders that may not see eye to eye. This is one reason why I absolutely love this food policy conference is because I do feel like it brings together some very divergent views and that's something we need to continue doing, but I don't find that there's a lot of space for that um, in these conversations locally, nationally, or globally. Um, so I don't know if that's necessarily like this call to action, um, but maybe uh, because that's, that's one critical piece that I think we're missing. Like, look at, how, look at how long it took for us to talk about one word, um, let alone a lot of other complex subjects in the food system. And then to end it off, uh, I also wrote it down because it really struck me as powerful. Peter, I, I wanted to jump off a concept that Peter mentioned about what the food system in fact has done. Um, that the food system has improved, has achieved a global net increase in food security. And I think I want to emphasize that and not to, not, to, um, not to minimize or not to take away from the inequities that do exist in the food system, but maybe as a message of hope, because each and every one of us are here working on the food system. And so if we've been able to bring it up to this point, um, which I think is, is a fact, to be celebrated, then all of the problems that we still do find within the food system should be addressed with all the passion in the room. So um, that's it. I come from a place of optimism with it. And, uh, and thank you for the platform to, to have some of these conversations. Thanks, Lauren. Um, and thanks for reminding us of the importance of all kind of being in conversation together and, and really learning, I think, from each other and our perspectives. So we have a very rich discussion in the chat and um, I'm gonna pass it on uh, to uh, Patricia who's going to um, lead us through a bit of a final discussion before Don closes us up. So thank you all so much for those answers in case I don't speak again. You're, you're all amazing, thank you. Thank you, Nadia. Um, in fact, thank you for all the presenters. We have been having an extremely active and rich conversation in the chat with lots of questions and comments. And I think this is a testament uh, to the importance, as Lauren just uh, mentioned, of panels such as these bringing uh, diverse um, perspectives, opinions, uh, views of point, points of view, and also the importance of uh, trying to think of if we can kind of find ways to bridge uh, some of those silos. So it's going to be very challenging for me. Now I see there are more questions and comments uh, being added as I'm speaking. But one thing that I think came up a few times that perhaps um, our speakers could uh, elaborate a little bit more is this question of um, technology, but not only technology in terms of uh, improving food security from a technical perspective, but inclusive technology, I'm kind of creating now a, a way to, to try to bridge all those, those different questions. Uh, the question is, 
technology we can escape, right? And technology will influence good systems in one way or the other. Is there um, a way, Diana, to uh, try to think about policy or social movements or social ways to make this technology more socially inclusive and also environmentally uh, conscious? I think perhaps this is one question that uh, could uh, address Marsha's question, but then uh, uh, Alisa's question. Of course, it's going to be impossible to address all the questions, but this is something that perhaps you could, um, if you can address from your very different perspectives, how do you see the role of, of technology? And I think a second question that may also bridge some of those different comments and questions has to do with the uh, policy and law, because necessarily we are still uh, engaging in very colonial, post-colonial legal systems that uh, are territorially based. But then lots of uh, the comments uh, were about how in the food system, it's, it transcends this. It's about social and sometimes environmental ecosystems relations that transcend those systems. How do you see this tension of um, law and policy being so territorialized and those food systems transcending all of these. And of course, these weaves with the indigenous legal traditions that have not been recognized yet. And I link this to the other very interesting discussion about restoring or transforming. Uh, because I think in the case of a law and policy, we can think about uh, repairing or restoring because what we have need necessarily to be transformed because we don't want it to, we need to decolonize our legal systems and our policy systems. So I think that's something that I heard from some, at least some of the speakers. So perhaps this could start uh, the continuation of our conversation and I will take another look and, uh, and see if there is any other thing. We have now only 12 minutes, I guess, Nadia? And Peter, there are some questions for you. So I also invite you. Let me see if I can bridge from your question to some of the other ones. Okay. I mean, I, I said that one of the points I tried to make is that for established things, we build rules. We build governing systems. We, we organize. So we, you know, modern improved uh, breeding techniques, not GMOs, but just the, the, the ability to use the best germplasm and others. We built an international system to take what we developed in, in developed countries and to translate it and make it scalable in food insecure parts of the world. So that, that's the consultative group of international agricultural research centers. And they've done a lot to move technologies between countries to, to assist with food security. So, and, and it, Canada's at the, the forefront of much of that. You know, the three big crops that we run in Western Canada are wheat, canola, and, and pulses. Wheat and pulses, we did the the, uh, the gene maps on. Pretty much all of our technology is given abroad. Canola, which we created, we gave away the technology to the world. So it's being used in India and Bangladesh and, and China very extensively with no commercial engagement beyond the initial transfer of the technology. So so we, we have systems that work for old tech. One of the questions was about uh, digital ag. Where does that fit? There's one where we don't have the rules yet. We don't have the systems. We have bits of it. The genetics is all open. It's all public domain. The, the, most of the science is public domain. When it gets down to actually breeding an individual variety, that gets very proprietary, but it, it's not exclusive. It's not like others don't have competing varieties. It's just that the modern, the more improved varieties are, are, are of limited control. But then we, the question is, what do we do with the data that's emerging? That's the fundamental question. And, and we have some norms that are starting to evolve, but it's, you know, we just started to really collect big data in agriculture in the last two or three years. And farmers are doing it individually. They're clubbing together in Saskatchewan and in other parts of the world to manage their own data. There are, there are small companies, there are, are cooperatives that are merging into this space. The industry itself is trying to come to some norms. So this is part of the challenge with technology is that something new turns up it destabilizes a whole bunch of ways we make choices and how we operate. And, and these new technologies take a while to, to, to build up uh, a, an ability to, to 
make them both efficient, as Lauren said, but but to deal with some of these inequities that are that emerge from from technology, because usually early adopters are the big winners. But the, the real benefit for society is when they diffuse to as many people as possible. And that's that's part of the architecture of the global food system is that we do that pretty well, far better than almost every other industry you can imagine. Most of the others stay very proprietary. The food system actually gets the technology out in the hands of producers in ways that makes it available to consumers in local markets. So that's that's the art of the system. You don't want to lose that part. You want to you want to build on top of that rather than than undercut that ability to to uh, to do what we've been doing over the last 50 or 60 years to improve food security for most of us around the world. I'm wondering if I could jump in there. I I would say I, I don't necessarily agree with that perspective. I, I honestly think, you know, just for context, venture capitalist has invested more than $4 billion in um, ag tech and agri and you know, that has been predominantly um, inaccessible to new entrants or to people who are working on a small scale farming uh, orientation. And that is the majority of farmers in Canada. And I think that there's a couple of pieces of this puzzle that I think are important for us to consider. So first off, I think that when we talk about technologies and technological adaptation, I think it completely uh, excludes the fact that there is a spectrum of technology. And in fact, a lot of the traditional knowledges uh, and low tech solutions that people wouldn't necessarily think about as technology aren't honored or respected or thought about in those processes. Technology in the way that I think that we're speaking about it is quite limited. And I think that uh, technologies that are ancient, you know, ancient, very, very old, and that are far more um, aligned with agroecological agro practices are completely removed from that sphere of investment. And I think are far more accessible and malleable and responsive uh, and really are, are better positioned for large scale adoption. So I think that that's the first piece that I would highlight in this conversation. And because because the question was really about how do we uh, increase the adoption and make it more accessible. I think thinking about technology from that much broader, expansive, inclusive lens. That also comes back to what you were saying, uh, Patricia, about recognizing indigenous traditional knowledges, as well as knowledges of other um, first peoples in, across the world is I think a key part of that. Uh, the second is I think in that review of, you know, Canada bringing its technology around the world, I think there also has to be, once again, us thinking about this ethical lens of in bringing our technology there, what other things were we completely ignoring? Uh, technologies, traditions, histories that were being used that actually were quite effective, but perhaps were invisible to uh, you know, external interventions because of the ways that we were tracking what success and productivity uh, looked like. And I think in what ways did that more homogenous approach to, to implementing these different technologies completely remove the, the need for greater diversity and the benefits that that also brings in, in our systems from a cultural, social perspective, but also from an ecological perspective and understanding the importance of environmental diversity. And I think in addition to that, I would also really, um, you know, in, in this recent research I've done, I was able to really uh, meet with quite a number of diverse uh, and new entrant farmers and the vast majority of them in fact were not necessarily interested in adopting technology so there was also this assumption that technology is the future and that is what you know how do how do we expand it how do we grow it but i think we need to come back from what what are we really solving for and we're making an assumption that technology is the answer to that and i'm not saying there isn't a place for technology and there isn't some desire but i think we need to come back to what are we truly trying to repair what are we truly trying to advance and what what role does technology have and how can we expand our understanding that better meet the needs of those who perhaps do not have access? Because that's not to say that some of these uh, folks who uh, don't have access aren't interested. Maybe the last thing I'll say is a key piece of this technology conversation is the how, how things are integrated. So in Canada, a lot of technological integration, whether that be in the dairy sector, uh, in the meat sector, has actually worked to further disenfranchise workers. Um, and so uh, it has actually cut jobs for many immigrant workers, uh, replacing them with more me mechanization of their work, and in fact, um, hasn't really improved worker conditions. Uh, so I think that if we're thinking about technology to play a role in creating a more just, equitable uh, kind of food system and actually removing the intensive 
uh, you know, quite, un, you know, in many ways, challenging labor uh, that that many racialized low income immigrant workers uh, are the ones doing, then I think it's a, a whole shift on how we're approaching the role that technology can play, because I think um, that would be a conversation that's more aligned with some of the principles I think we started to speak about today. Um, I, I'm not sure, Patricia, if you just want us to speak broadly to some of the other things, but maybe I'll just get it in now to leave space for others. But I think that um, coming back to this idea of transforming the food system uh, versus restoring the food system, I would just say from my own personal perspective, I think when we use the language of restore versus transform, it honors uh, all of the experiences and histories that have come before this moment. And it really broadens, once again, our approach to what solutions might look like. Because I think how you define the challenge is always going to open the door for what you see as a solution. And so I think in this context, if we if we value the idea or recognize the need for uh, decolonization, if we understand that there are some practices that are worth keeping, there are some traditions uh, that are, are useful for us to consider, I think there's more opportunity for this idea of restore. I think restore also recognizes the fact that it's not that we wanna throw the baby out with the bathwater, it's actually that we, we just need to shift and uh, think about regeneration. We need to think about sustainability. We need to think about the, re the recurrent relationships that are in play and what role we have in them. So it's a far more relational circular approach, which I think broadly we're seeing uh, recognized uh, from a variety of different actors within the food space. So uh, I would definitely say that I would I would lean toward this repair lens. And maybe the last thing I'll say about it is that I think a, a restore lens also lends to this idea that um, there are broader injustices, uh, social injustices uh, around, you know, whether that's racism, whether that's around labor injustice, whether that's climate injustice, and that uh, restore understanding opens the door for a reparative frame legally and otherwise to think about what change looks like. Thank you. Go ahead, though. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Malena. I really always appreciate the depth of which you, you speak to the, uh, bring the social justice lens into it. And I think um, until, um, I mean, I, I'm encouraged that, um, you know, um, we are struggling as human beings to find our oneness, but there's a huge number of uh, paradoxes in our existence. And we're dealing with multiple overlapping existential crises, which a lot of the technocracy doesn't need to be concerned about. And I think that that is a core, like I feel like technology is a trap. The more technology we rely on it, the more re um, resources we extract, the more indigenous land is being um, 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 dug up and uh, burned and, and destroyed, you know? I think that there's, we're at a time in human history where we need to truth a lot and, and we need to embrace the uncertainty of what that transformation is going to look like. And I, you know, as much as like, I've studied restoration of natural systems um, and I, and as much as yes, restoration is important and, and that I agree with you, Malena, however, I think restoration gives us the, uh, the, the, there's a philosophy around that that makes us feel like, oh, we can, we can cause the damage and it can always be restored. Well, in indigenous food systems, there's some ecosystems that will never be restored. An alpine mountain ecosystem would take thousands of years to restore it. I think what we're losing on this planet in large part because of the large scale monocultural approach to the global food system is not calling for more technological solutions. It's calling for a cultural revolution for people to grow their own food, to get along with their neighbors and figure out how to share. You know, that's an ex exact opposite set of values and ethics than the large scale resource extraction economy. It's a taking economy, it's extractive. And meanwhile, the social justice is calling for more giving and sharing. Why is it that the top 1% of corporations are in being favored in this system to consolidate land, water, and infrastructure? When people are hungry in a first world country like Canada, 
in one of the top wealthiest cities in Vancouver, we have epidemic proportions of homelessness, drug addiction, food insecurity. These are all very interconnected and we, we can't look at that um, through the narrow lens of technology and the neoliberalist uh, framework, uh, very capital intense um, resource extraction economy. Um, I think it's becoming more and more well-documented. Um, you know, that we, um, just the harm that that's causing, but I think the contradiction and embracing the uncertainty and contradictions and asking wicked systemic problems, um, coyote questions, transformer questions in my culture. Coyote, you know, as Shikwetmuk people, we were placed in our land by creator. Since time immemorial, we've been given messages from old one. Those messages still live in our knowledge system that is not being accounted for at all in this Western science-based techno-bureaucratic framework. That's cognitive imperialism. That's asserting that ultimate voice of truth and reason only comes from Western science. Yet we've got ancient knowledge systems to assess the key conditions necessary for having indigenous rights recognized in policy, planning and governance, we need to have a system that it not only acknowledges and respects our knowledge, but actually applies it. And that is not a controlled experiment. Western science cannot do that. Climate change is not a controlled experiment. We need to embrace uncertainty and create more adaptive systems. And we need to have indigenous leaders and thought leaders at those tables shaping and forming what that looks like because there will not be any justice for anybody around the world on stolen land and that is you know i don't know how to say it in any other way i can't say it without the passion um, and until that karmic cycle is transformed and i do think it's transformative because coyote teaches us through his own bad behavior we have a lot of stories and oral, oral history um, that reinforces how powerful that is. Quantum science is catching up to align with that transformative worldview and how we shape our world based on how we observe it. And so I think um, technology is not the only solution. There is a lot of appropriate technology. You know, we, we, I think it's a, it's a myth to think that technology is what's given us the highest level of comfort that any humans have ever experienced throughout humanity, uh, humanity. Yes, that's true. But I think it's a very subjective statement to say that because indigenous peoples lived here for millennia and beautiful, wealthy economies beautiful, rich, deep knowledge that made the human experience so powerful. And I remember some of that in my ancestry. We haven't lost that yet. We need indigenous law to, to help us realize in praxis and to, to attune to the natural law and the capacity of nature to regenerate and heal and transform. So um, I think that... Um, Anything else is, is essentially um, control and it's control with no soul. And I'm quoting Madika er Erica Irene Diaz, who was the former a chairperson for the United Nations Permanent Forum on Indigenous Peoples a number of years ago. It was, it's been talked about at length at, at the United Nations level and in many Indigenous nations, but we're calling on all of our brothers and sisters from the all four colors of the race to stand with us in solidarity as we activate a new and exciting solidarity economy that is deep and meaningful truth and reconciliation. And I think the food system is the first place we start because we all eat food. Food becomes us. It's the most transformative thing we do every single day of our lives. The fact that we have been gifted these bodies to transform the food into us that comes from the land. Therefore, we are all the land. And we can't separate ourselves from that. And we need a system that will help to reconnect that truly and transcend beyond this neoliberal, uh, technically oriented um, food system that pretty much controls the world. 
Wow, what a rich conversation we've had. Lauren, you haven't had a chance to give your last two uh, um, uh, words of wisdom. Uh, we wanted in a sense of equity for all of the panelists to have a chance to, to respond to the, uh, the last round of questioning. And then I'm gonna have to close off because uh, we're over time. Well, uh, you, are, you are in luck, Don, um, because my thoughts are very brief. Um, I don't think the question of the role of technology has to be necessarily at this either or question. Um, I think I think it's there is a role um, and, and there is a role for the people behind it and the people who are marginalized by it. Um, so in that saying, like there's a role for people and there's a role for technology. And I don't think the two are necessarily always mutually exclusive. Thank you, Lauren. Well, uh, when I started, I promised you all a rich buffet and I hope you are well fed because we probably could have had this panel for another couple of hours and we wouldn't have even scratched the surface. So I wanna take this opportunity to thank the presenters, the panelists who very much spoke from the heart. They took their professional role and their personal role and their, their, their whole being to explore some of these very complex questions. Um, the ideas of social justice, of food security, of nutrition generation, of science and te technology, the idea of an existing food system and whether it needs transformation or restoration um, while still providing nutrition for 8 billion people in the world. These are fundamentally difficult questions. They're fundamentally questions which will require ongoing research, discussion, dialogue. I'm so pleased that we're able to be a forum for that kind of dialogue. And what the role for lawyers will be, that is an open question. You are the next generation of lawyers and policymakers in this field. And I salute you um, to keep those dialogue uh, channels open and appreciate that we have different perspectives and we are working for some kind of, of uh, common goals for a common heritage. So with that, uh, again, I'd like to also thank um, the organizers and the technicians that were behind the scenes and also the audience who stayed right to the end with amazing questions. And so don't go away. Our closing ceremony is going to be starting in exactly seven minutes. And there's some really interesting things going on there. We're gonna announce the, the winner of the Emerging Law Voices uh, competition. And if anybody sat in on those uh, papers presented yesterday, we are in very good hands. So uh, I look forward to that and to the closing uh, remarks, which will start now in seven minutes. So thank you to you all and uh, for your attention, your questions, and uh, really appreciate your participation in this conference.